time for the, the, the second speaker. And uh, so we're very pleased to have here today Dr. Daniel Sage. Uh, Daniel joined the biomedical imaging group uh, uh, of the Professor Unser at the Col uh, Polytechnique Federal de Lausanne, EPFL, in 1998 as responsible of the ad of the software development. He is currently in charge of the support uh, to the researchers of the laboratory and also uh, to the research community of the EPFL Center for Imaging. He is involved in uh, numerous research projects in computational bioimaging, including super-resolution microscopy, tracking, the convolution, and image quantification. He is engaged in um, uh, the open source software development for the life science community using both engineering and machine learning methods. Today, he will talk about DeepImageA, a user-friendly environment to run deep, image, uh, deep learning model in ImageA. So please, Daniel, the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you very much for this kind introduction, and thank you for the organizer. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> do you see my screen? Everything is okay? My, my cursor, also my pointer? When I move? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> so, um, today, so I have, a, I have a talk which is entitled uh, Microscopy Image Analysis. Uh, do we shift to uh, now to the deep learning? So, I will try to, to give a few answers on, uh, on this very large question. Um, so you know that we are all faced now to two paradigms in image analysis, and we have to, the, the classical um, uh, paradigm, which is uh, based on the, on the knowledge, driven by the knowledge, and based on a priori model, and the other side, the more modern one, which is driven by the data. And, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, so the, 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 the classical one is based on, on physical rules, based on knowledge and a priori that you have on the sample or based also on the biophysic uh, law, like typically the propagation of the light. And typically if we speak about deconvolution, usually we use a strong model which is behind. And the, on the other side, everything it's, uh, uh, is uh, adaptive to the, to the data, which is cool. Uh, so the, the drawback of the data-driven method is usually that we, we call the black box effect. So there is no guarantee of convergence and the validation of the data. So there is no proof on, of convergence, which is uh, we, we do not have really insight of the structure of the problem. And that's also a little bit, uh, what's a little bit difficult to, to have is to, um, in data-driven method is to explain the, the, the typically the error to have an error analysis. That's we it's not there is no really explain explainability of the how it works. Uh, the question of the generaliz generalizability, which is <laughs> difficult to, to say <laughs> for me. Uh, so that's a, a strong claim of the uh, intelligent uh, artificial, uh, of course, and uh, in terms of computation. Uh, we know that uh, the, the data-driven and deep learning method are very slow when we train, but when it's trained, it could be very efficient. Uh, so in terms of uh, microscopy image analysis, so there is a good paper that uh, summarizes what we, we do usually in image analysis. So, and it's probably some of them are, are also in your community in, the, in calcium imaging. We have also the same kind of thing. So we, uh, we have image enhancements, uh, object detection, typically neuron detection, image segmentation, object classification, and image classification. Okay. And, but we have also a strong part, which is um, the image reconstruction. So typically the convolution, denoising, or more in the, in the super resolution, we have what's through the structure, illumination, microscopy, or localization microscopy. All this method is called image reconstruction. And for all of them, we can have, we can train a neural network, or we can have more uh, the, the more modern one, which is called generative model or deep image prior to, to do, uh, to achieve this task of image reconstruction. So now uh, just a, a recall, a reminder, when we want, I speak here about only the supervised deep learning for image analysis. So if we have a supervised system, we need training data, training data and validation data. Uh, so, and usually we need many data to, to uh, to train the systems. We need also raw data and annotated data, typically in segmentation. And uh, so we, we spend a lot of time usually to train a model. When it's trained, it's easy to use this model to uh, apply to an image at, and to have a prediction. I should say there is another step, which is um, 
there often done uh, is the transfer learn learning. So if you have a trained model uh, with a lot of data, if you want to specialize, speci um, make the system a little bit more specific to your problem, you can just add a few pairs of, uh, of images to have a specific trained model that you can after apply to your, your data. So uh, today, that's uh, what I want, would like to speak. It's uh, the, the part one is about the data and change and risk. So it's uh, so here I have three recent paper on, on deep learning. So it's why I will uh, I will present this this three uh, this three paper very quickly. Uh, if I have time, I will present also the last one. So the the first one is about the data and challenge and risk. It's just consideration about the deep learning, and the second one is to uh, to propose the some of uh, easy solution to, uh, to, to achieve deep learning and specifically about this tool, which is called Deep Image. And then I have an application which is in digital pathology. Uh, so the first question that we have when we start uh, with a deep learning system is how to get ground truth data. That's, <laughs> that's all the people have to, uh, to answer this question. So uh, of course, the first one, which is, uh, yeah, you, you get uh, the ground truth from expert. So the, in this paper in, uh, in 2017, uh, there, there was a lot of uh, images, skin lesion images, which, which was annotated by, uh, by a dermatologist. And that took a long time. And there was so many images that the system can very well perform. So usually it's difficult to access to all these expertise. Uh, so people uh, have a, a funny way to, to do it. It's also to, uh, to ask to the, to the, to the citizen. <laughs> it, it's called citizen science to, to ask the crowd to, to annotate data as a video game. So it's, uh, uh, some, some people have done this kind of, um, of, annotation, of annotation, but usually when you are front of your data, you have to use manual annotation. So you, you, you ask your PhD student or your master student to annotate manually the many, many images. So there was a lot of tools that, uh, that appear now, uh, augmentation, um, annotator, J segmentator, web knows, and so on. But okay, here we have still a question about the 3D because uh, yeah, annotated data in 3D is not obvious on the, on the 2D screen. And also when you have time, it's another, another issue. Uh, so maybe you can have access to semi-automatic tools like uh, Elastic, Weka, LabKit that help uh, you. So you annotate a part and the program continue to add the annotation to the, to the rest of the, of the image. Uh, another way to access to ground truth data is to use this large public database we know all the image net, which is a famous one, which is used to, to organize the, the challenge in deep learning. So based on image net, you can extract some important features and then uh, visual features. And then uh, using this fine tuning or trust card learning, you can sp uh, make your model more specific. Uh, there is also on some domain, and maybe that's something that you have to do in your community, is to, uh, to organize like a large uh, challenge with many, many, many data, uh, such a way that uh, the people can, uh, uh, and of course, you, you have also to provide the, the ground truth data to compare different kinds of software. Okay, another uh, way to obtain a good, uh, clean data or ground truth data is to use this uh, alternative strategy. And uh, one that I like very much is this one in microscopy. Sometimes you, you, you have access to uh, typically, in this example, a better resolution. If you acquire a 3D stacks of images, usually the resolution in the, in the plane is much larger than the resolution in the axial plane. So you use the, the lateral plane as the ground truth to uh, um, to deconvolve in the axial plane. So that's a way to access to good data. It's not ground truth, but it's still good data. 
Uh, and the, the one that I like uh, also very much is the microscopy simulation. So you, in microscopy and typically in process microscopy, we have a good knowledge of the propagation of the, uh, of the light. So that means uh, by equation, we can make pretty good simulation and very realistic simulation. We know how to, uh, uh, to, 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 uh, to simulate the image propagation, so the, that in the image formation with the PSF, with the noise, Poisson noise, and, and so on. And there is the different example. I have done a lot of job in this uh, with the simulation in localization microscopy here, but uh, we can also simulate some uh, like typically here colony of bacteria, these kind of things. And the image is very re realistic uh, because we know how to, to to build these fluorescent uh, images. Uh, okay, and uh, in imagine that you have uh, already a data a way also to, to, uh, to have a much larger number of data. You can make uh, this uh, data augmentation uh, things, which uh, every, every people do, uh, do now in our days. So the data augmentation increase the diversity because you that makes you you, you rotate your image or you uh, or you deform your image in such a way you, you increase the, the size of your, your your data set, and the data augmentation squeezes these better performances or prevents also overfittings. So typically it's, uh, you can uh, degrade your image by adding noise or making random transformation geometric transformation. But here I should say there is. A lot of uh, there is a space to do uh, to to um, invent a new data augmentation that typically deform as a macroscope deform typically to blur as using a PSF or, or to add the noise that you find in the in, in the microscopes. So there is probably a, a lot of things to do in this, uh, in this domain in the data augmentation by simulating the deformation that we have in in the microscopes. So data is the critical question. And so there is a lot of promises of the deep learning. And so the results are just like magic. We, uh, yeah, we just have to provide data and think that we don't need to, to think too much. Uh, no need uh, any more math or engineering skills. It's a fast system. Yeah, but yeah, there is this problem of ground truth data. So really the, the, the key, key question is you have to design scientifically your data set uh, making good preparation, validation, good annotation, have an integrity of the data. And, and also you have to open the data, share your data uh, to, uh, to, be, to have a scientific process such a way that the people can reproduce your results. So now if you propose a deep learning system, of course you have to provide and to open your, the, the, the data. That's, uh, that's part of the, of the systems. Uh, and there is many, many questions that uh, that's happened. The, the, the first that every people has, how many images do, do, I, do we need to, to train the system? So it's really depend on the variability of your systems. And uh, okay, uh, <clears throat> so some risk and uh, some challenge and risk, okay. So usually if imagine now you have your uh, image data set, so the path is not, um, is uh, still uh, there is several questions that you have to have to uh, answer to to achieve something. Uh, so the first, do I need uh, deep learning? Yeah, yeah, because that's happened sometimes. People are are using deep learning because they, they, they find it seems very easy to use it and so on. But probably it could be also that in some cases it's an overuse of the deep learning, so it's unnecessary complication. And here, we really need to educate the image analyst people in such a way that they, they can identify the problem where deep learning makes sense and where the image classical imaging analysis is enough to solve the problem, which is not always completely obvious. Uh, after maybe the, the, the another question that you should ask, maybe the pre-trained model is already exists, so I, I should find some uh, in some places, uh, typically find on the web, uh, is there already a, a pre-trained model that solves my, my, my stuff? Of course, if you search like that on the web, it's really risky because maybe the, the, the model is not, was not completely well-trained or not completely well-documented. So there is, before to take a pre-trained model, you have to, 
to have uh, some uh, sanity check and typically uh, is it well documented is it is the data is accessible is it a valid system is it pub published uh, model and so on and uh, things that happen now and i will speak a little bit some people are creating what we call zoo so that's a place where there is a repository where you store a pre-trained model uh, with a good documentation and with uh, also with uh, access to the to the to the data set. Uh, okay. The other thing that it was a little bit what I said just before. So how many data we we need? So you you need uh, as much as the viability of your problem is. And typically there is this question about the data data set shift. Uh, there is different kind of the shift um, that can decrease the, the performance uh, of your system or, or create some kind of hallucination. I, I have an example just after. And the answer to that is to, uh, to make a fine tuning. So uh, if you have this, this, uh, this variance between your uh, that data that you use for the training and the data where you make the prediction, uh, so please retrain the system with a fine tuning to, to achieve good results. And at the end, there is still a question of the interpretability or explainability of the, of the system. Can I trust my result? So some people are really overconfident. Uh, it seems that it's, it's like a magic. Other people are completely skeptic about the result. So maybe make the good balance. And uh, the answer about that is to uh, to question yourself about the re the results, so do not uh, before to to say it works or do not works uh, uh, like that. Uh, I have just few examples where I perturbate a little bit uh, a system. Here I have a, a deep learning uh, system. Here I have an image with a face contrast image where I want to segment this kind of, uh, of cells. Uh, and uh, okay, when I I, I train a system which work well on the same size, and then I suddenly I change the size, so I increase the size of the of the image to see how robust is the systems, and you see that clearly it do not work. So that's uh, um, and what it's a little bit amazing if I uh, shrink the the size of the image, it still continues to work a little bit, but after a while it do not work anymore. So that's that showed that the the my system when I, I trained this, this, uh, this system to for the to do the segmentation is really uh, dependent of the size of the object that I want to detect. So uh, I cannot make uh, this system completely general for or, or at least this one. So if I want to be able to to detect also the cell at this size, probably I have to add other kind of data in my uh, my model, train again to increase the viability of the of the systems here another 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 example of the the same thing so it was uh, done by uh, Wei Weigan or um, he developed a system to to localization microscopy which is called Hana Palm and here uh, he has this kind of structure and he trained the system uh, to make super localization on this kind of structure so it works well uh, the prediction was was okay uh, he trained also um, the, the the system anapalm with this kind of structure, it's called uh, the nuclear pore here, to, to, and it was able to achieve super resolution very well. But suddenly, it decided to permute the, the, the two systems, and here it's completely uh, there was hallucination. It's completely crazy. So uh, that's uh, we we observe that the, the system creates some shape, but it's completely wrong. So that's. Uh, that sh shows also that the sy this system was really specific to the structure of the image, to the, not only on the acquisition, but it was a specific on the on the structure also. That's that could also, depending on the kind of system you have, that could happen. Uh, so uh, there was this uh, adversarial uh, adversarial attack. So that's uh, that's a system that. Uh, to, to check the robustness of your deep learning system. So you, you take an image, uh, then you add artificial degradation, and then you, you make the prediction. And uh, you can, of course, measure if it uh, if it works well. So uh, here I have the, the answer without the degradation, and here I have the answer with the degradation. 
And of course, you see that it does not work so very well. So I have just a few examples here. Also, I took these images. Um, and uh, the system was working, was well trained. So I, I was able to detect very well the, the, the cell here. But I had some perturbation. I can just show one of them. Uh, I do not see, it. yes, it's here. Uh, I just add a little bit of speckle noise. And uh, just, that means I just add a few points in white and the system will start to, to work really bad. So the, you see that it was not able to well detect the, the sum of, of the part. And uh, here I just modified the, also the, the, the contrast. And you see that by high, we, we do not see anymore, but the system was really robust to this kind of degradation. Usually a system is, uh, deep learning system is really robust to the low, uh, typically if I apply a low pass filter, it's really robust. And if I, uh, if I make a high pass, uh, filter as a perturbation, it's not completely, it's, it's really bad. Okay, that's a, some of conclusion that we can have in the segmentation process. Um, so let's say that now uh, I would like to, to present some uh, zero code solution uh, for that. So you know that if you want to, uh, to, to, uh, to access to the deep learning, uh, system so if you want to train a deep learning system uh, you have to know probably python and you have to to access to this huge library which is the tensor for uh, or pytorch or so on and certainly you need a good computer typically with gpu so it's not accessible to every uh, everyone so uh, here there is a, some proposal to, uh, to make the system more democratic so it's accessible to every people. And just after, the, uh, to me, I think, there is Carson, she will present the cell pose. So that's uh, one of a good, very good example how to democratize the, the deep learning for, for a certain number of tasks. Um, uh, there is other, other proposals. So I will speak about the uh, bioimage model zoo. I will speak about deep image and I will tell you a few words about the zero cost DL for me. So the first, uh, the first uh, slide here about the democratization is this bioimage bio -image model zoo. So, um, so you know that it's some, uh, some life scientists want to access to, to models. So here, uh, it's, a, it's a website. Uh, where is the link? Here, okay. Uh, it's a website where you can, uh, you have a list of um, pre-trained models that you can, of course, uh, make fine tuning after all. Uh, but uh, it's a, a list of pre-trained models and that the, some developer have de developed and shared this information and they upload to the, to the systems. Uh, so it's, uh, it's an initiative taken by Emma Lundberg, but also uh, Florian Jung, Mac Reschug, and a lot of people in there that was uh, really active in, in this field. And we are part of with deep images. So there is different tools that are, uh, that are now Align with this, uh, with uh, have the same way to share the information. So it's elastic, zero cost, enjoy, Fiji, deep image, and so on. So the, um, probably we have also IC very, uh, and QPass will be will be also in this, in this system in the, in the next weeks. I think uh, that means all these people can really now interoperate uh, together. So. Typically, you can train a network on Elastics uh, and train your model on Elastic and use it in image through deep image. That's that's possible. So um, another good uh, good system to uh, to train uh, without any coding and without any effort and also completely free. <laughs> is to use this uh, zero cost DL for me. So it's a collection of Jupyter notebook. Uh, it's free because it runs on Google Collab. So Collab, it's a, uh, it's a system, it's a cloud computing system offered by, uh, by Google. So it's, it's not completely free because there is some uh, limitation. And of course, Google uh, scan your data. So it's not, uh, 
the thing is completely free. But uh, at least you you can you you have an access to uh, to good uh, GPU during a certain amount of times. I think it's twelve hours now, and you can uh, put your data on your Google Drive. You you press on the different button through following the Jupyter notebook, and at the end you are uh, you can. Uh, store your, your models. In, in addition, you can store your model in the format of the bio model image zoo. So you can store your model such a way that you can use it in image uh, with deep image. So that's a, that's a good feature that we have at the end. So it's uh, when it's trained, you can really use it uh, as ever, uh, in your favorite tools. In fact. Uh, so deep images. So probably I assume that uh, every people in, in this room knows image. Uh, yeah, I'm right. So it's image or Fiji. Uh, that's uh, that's a tool probably that many many people knows in biology at least in life science also to uh, to make image analysis. So it was written in Java. So Java it's really complicated to uh, to have access to to deep learning because there is no easy way to access to. Uh, uh, to GPU and so on. So here we have developed tools uh, to only make the prediction. So there is no training in, inside uh, deep image. So we only do the prediction. And we can load, of course, the model from the bio uh, image zoo. Uh, so there is few options, typically uh, the tiled option, which is very, very cool because if you have a large image, uh, probably you, can, you will not able to to, to run the, the model on the on the laptop because it's too uh, too uh, too large with too many convolution and so on, so we we, we are able to uh, to cut the image in so in, in tiles with a certain number of overlaps and we process tile by tile such a way that we save the memory. Uh, we have also now uh, the beginning. It was only for the what we call image to image application. So the input is an image, the output is an image. But now we can also enter the input could be an image or a series of image or volume of three images, and the output could be a table. And typically, typically it's very useful if we make classification of cell or something like that. So it's uh, it's very easy. So there is no programmation at all. You do not see any Python, the Java code. So it's macro recordable as uh, we see. So uh, and it's it's one click installation. As it's a, it's like a regular plugin of uh, image. So for the people that knows the plugin of image, deep image is not yet that then another another plugin for for, uh, for image that which is able to run a model of deep learning. Okay. Uh, when we have a deep learning uh, systems, a model like that, so you enter an image, you run your model, you have an output, there is a few things that you should also be, be very, pay, you should pay attention is the, is the, is the, so that's a prediction and that's the uh, post processing. So that's not the end of the story. So you, very often at the end, you have a, a probability map. And uh, you have, if you want to classify or to segment, you have to apply typically a threshold or watershed or, or analyze particle command of, of image. So that's which is possible uh, using the classical command of image. And there is certainly also front of that, there is a pre-processing. And uh, usually you have to make a normalization and you can do it uh, it, uh, through image uh, deep image so deep image runs the pre-processing which is uh, which is advised by the developer of the model run the prediction and run the post-processing if there is a post-processing to do uh, so it, uh, i have an example here and the uh, cool stuff in deep image it's macro recordable so uh, you can just uh, macro callable so for the people that knows the macro image, they can just say run deep image, put the name of the models and so on. And that's it, that will be that runs. Um, okay, um, I will speed up a little bit. Um, okay, there, there is one thing which is important. So a model, um, it's now, uh, it could be a TensorFlow model or a PyTorch model. It's the model 
uh, itself plus a certain number of metadata that we have to to add in the zoo such a way that we can interpret so and typically uh, we put also the the pre-processing the post-processing but also the testing testimonial images and so on I have just a video yeah, just to to illustrate uh, deep image <clears throat> So you have a plugin, you choose your model and you apply and run it and so on. But the, and as usual in image, you have a lot of window that happens everywhere. Okay. So it was the, the interesting things is this thing. So when you run the image, you that's uh, that's pop up a uh, window like that, and you can just choose the model that you want. If you if you do not have model in your image, you, there is a plugin which is called uh, model inst installer, something like that, and you can just access to the model which is uh, on the on the zoo or else or other on other places. So with DP Imager, we make a lot of connection and uh, with all these tools. So all these tools is connected with, uh, with DP Imager, enjoys the APIC, the Zoo, Zero Cost, and so on. Uh, do, we, do, do, do we have time to present the, the last topic? Five minutes uh, more? Yes, uh, perhaps very quickly. Quickly, wait, two minutes. Okay, two minutes. It's just a, an application, just to show an application, but there is a message behind which is important. Okay. <laughs> so it's an application in deep learning digital pathology. So it's completely classic in, in, the, in this, uh, this sense. So you know that we have this very, very large image where you want to, to count uh, the, number of nuclei, the number of nuclei. So and here, the, the application that we, are, we have, it's a little bit different because we don't want only to count, but we want to classify in two class because it's a xenograph model. So there is mouse uh, nuclear mouse cell and mouse and uh, human cells, and we want to classify. And uh, okay, the shape are a little bit similar. So we uh, because now we have Martin Weigert, which is a DPFL. So we use the, the famous tool, which is called Stardis, which is called which is a, a deep learning. Um, uh, model to uh, to re to recognize dense object uh, which is uh, have a round uh, almost a round shape so typically this kind of shapes and it works very well it's very fast on this kind of images so it's able to detect a lot uh, almost everything so that's what that was perfect uh, and then we compute some uh, features so typically the size morphological feature size elongation intensity and so on uh, we train also a uh, very uh, classifier to uh, to uh, to be able to classify human on mouse, and the result was really poor. So that was a little bit uh, disappointing. So we decide to add other features, and here we just extend the nuclei a little bit. We just uh, yeah uh, make a like a deletion of the to capture the, the information in the cytoplasm, and we measure the texture inside the the cytoplasm. So we have different, we have typically the variance and uh, these aralic uh, features to, uh, and we train again uh, classifier to be able to classify uh, using the morphological, uh, morphological information and the text, textural features. Uh, we obtained this kind of result, 85, uh, so it was not enough. And uh, the reason it's because uh, the, it was the, the 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 classification the type of the the the, the cells were, was more were more based on the the fact that they are, they are completely aligned so the human is completely aligned the other is a little bit in the other space so we decided to build a graph on the um, to try to connect them and typically we compute the yeah, the number of neighborhood the if they form a chain so we had other features. Uh, and we will start to, uh, to to run the classifier, and this time we we have a very good results. So using all the feature was the the trick in this, in this uh, to be able to classify the feature. Um, at the end, we have a very nice system that works uh, very well. And here, I should say that uh, yeah, that's the message. And maybe of the deep learning is uh, can work is everywhere. Yes, but also the classical image processing knowledge. Is still required here. We need to be able to, uh, to to build this kind of graph to make the connection to be able to 
compute some texture. So that's completely classical image processing to be able to classify. And that was a work which is done by all, everything was done in DPFL. And then the nice story that I have behind that we started the, 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 the project just before the pandemic. And we, we were able to meet together uh, to celebrate the paper at the end, uh, in June 2021. And some of the people, uh, we just met the people, uh, typically I just met uh, Elodie uh, here, just uh, in person when we celebrate the paper, not before. So everything was, uh, was done on Zoom meeting. So that's the end, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you, Daniel, for your very interesting talk. And I think we can uh, address a couple of questions from the audience. So would you like to just reply or uh, read it first? Yes, I will yeah. try to, to, to read. Okay, I start by the end. What is the Okay, the one is from Matteo Bruzzone, the other one from Federico Rossi. Okay, I see also uh, what is the best practice to share data uh, when it's huge, uh, zoo, uh, when it's several gigabytes. Uh, yeah. No, uh, no. The, the zoo it's not a the zoo is not a space to store. Maybe I, or it's just a, a page that makes the links to, to a storage place. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's really a high tech question. So often uh, the best way is okay. There is Zenodo first. Zenodo is probably one of the on the best place to store data to share it. But there is some limitation also. And after it's the your institution should provide the, the way to share the data. That's uh, that's uh, that's uh, one of my answer. Maybe there is all, yeah. But many people uh, share on on Zenodo. Okay, uh, Federico Rossi, for instance, a typical application. Uh, I have in mind is tracing the map object. Okay, uh, okay. The, the the one that I see there, it's a uh, really difficult question. So tracing the morphology on neuron for three D stacks. Um, so here I should say that's probably something which is really difficult to do fully in uh, using a deep learning system. What I will probably do is to split in two two phases. In this case, the first will be to uh, to design some kind of filter denoising. Uh, this kind of things in 3D and train a system to to uh, to achieve this task to to uh, to have neural which is better connecting and so on, and then the, it will help to uh, to make the connection and to have the full uh, the full tracing. But um, yeah. uh, okay, Marco Salamanca, do you have any suggestion on how to check if the model where we select for deep learning? is good enough um okay uh yes okay do, do you have any suggestion on how to check if the model we selected for deep learning is good enough okay there uh yes you can have a validation step and the validation you have to provide some data and also to clean data run through data and uh, you, you run you, you run some prediction and after you measure the discrepancy between your, your clean data and the, the output, and probably it's a good thing to do uh, all the time for every model. In fact, it's a good practice to uh, to uh, to validate your, your your systems. Of course, that's again that that requires some uh, some of the of clean data. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, okay, Daniel. Continue? Thanks a lot. And I think yeah. it's time to move to the next speaker. Yeah, maybe I will try to uh, answer okay. to people. Uh, I, I will try to to answer to return the answer if I have uh, uh, sure. on the on the Q and A. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I stop the sharing. Sorry. Excellent. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you.